My name's Max Feinstein, and I'm an anesthesiologist filming here in New York City at Mount Sinai Hospital. In this video, I'm gonna be discussing how anesthesiologists deal with intraoperative cardiac arrests, and also how we prepare for cases where we think there's a high likelihood of one occurring. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. Intraoperative cardiac arrest is a pretty rare occurrence. There was a very large study that found that an intraoperative cardiac arrest happened 5.6 times per 10,000 cases. And it's also worth pointing out that the likelihood is higher when you're working with higher risk patients who have pre-existing coronary artery disease or other types of comorbidities, and also in higher risk surgeries where there's a higher likelihood of problems, for example, hemorrhage. There are actually many different things that can lead to a cardiac arrest, and I'll just highlight the ones that are front of mind for me when I'm inside of the operating room. One of those is the fact that surgery is actually very stressful on the body. Even when patients are under general anesthesia and not aware of anything that's going on, the body still can have a very strong response to a surgical stimulant. For that reason, a big part of the anesthesiologist's job is actually minimizing the effect of surgical stress on the body. And one of the main ways that we do that is through the use of pain relieving medications. Again, even when a patient's under general anesthesia. I talk a lot more about that in a video that I made that's linked here, where I discuss the use of opioids intraoperatively. For many patients, having some surgical stress on the body doesn't cause any significant problems. But for patients who are sicker, and particularly those who have problems with their heart, one of the big concerns from an anesthesia perspective is whether that stress on the body leads to an increase in oxygen demand, especially oxygen demand from the heart, that is not adequately met by the oxygen supply that's available. And while anesthesiologists do routinely administer a significant amount of oxygen to patients during surgery, the simple fact of delivering oxygen to the patient's lungs isn't necessarily enough to get oxygen to all of the patient's vital organs. A big part of that is making sure that the heart is pumping adequately to get blood, which carries the oxygen, to the rest of the organs, including the heart itself. To tie all of this together, if you have a very sick patient whose heart doesn't work particularly well, then when surgical stress occurs, the heart has a difficult time circulating oxygenated blood to all of the vital organs, including the heart itself. And so when there's not enough oxygen getting to the heart, that can lead to a cardiac arrest. Another potential cause for cardiac arrest that is also very front of mind for me when I'm in the operating room is thinking about blood loss. Whether or not a patient is at a high risk of losing a lot of blood during surgery is in part a function of the surgery itself. For example, a surgery that necessitates only a very small incision that's this big probably isn't gonna bleed very much unless the surgeon happens to get into a major blood vessel. But if the surgical incision is this big, then one can imagine there's a lot more potential for bleeding. There are also other considerations like reoperations, where cutting through fibrosed tissue that was previously operated on has a higher risk of bleeding as well. There are also patient-related factors that can contribute to higher risk of bleeding. For example, any sort of abnormalities and the coagulation cascade, or any sort of external factors like a very cold operating room and the patient not being adequately warmed that can lead to a higher likelihood of bleeding. Suffice it to say, there are a lot of different factors that can contribute to surgical bleeding. And for that reason, anesthesiologists have to have an eye towards making sure that we have appropriate IV access so that we can transfuse blood products if they're medically necessary and also making sure that we have all of the devices necessary to rapidly transfuse blood products if that's something that's required. An excellent example of a device that can transfuse a very large volume of fluid in a short period of time is a Belmont transfuser, which as you can see can deliver a maximum of 750 milliliters per minute. Just as an aside, in order to transfuse at that high velocity, you do have to have very large IV access. And one of the options that we have is something called a rapid infusion catheter, which as you can see, provides very large IV access compared to a more standard type of IV that's used for routine surgery, which might be, for example, a 20 gauge IV. 
The last potential culprit that I'll mention in this video for intraoperative cardiac arrests are electrolyte abnormalities. And it's not unusual for us to monitor electrolytes during a surgery. For example, making sure that a patient's potassium or calcium are within safe limits. There can be changes that occur during surgery, for example, transfusing blood products, that can lead to significant changes in both potassium and calcium, as well as other electrolytes. And derangements in these electrolytes can potentially lead to a cardiac arrest. The way we check a patient's electrolytes are by drawing a blood sample and running it through a blood gas machine. We keep these in a lot of operating rooms because, of course, they're very convenient for assessing not only electrolytes, but also other lab values that can be analyzed and also derived from a patient's blood sample. If we do find intraoperative electrolyte disturbances, these are things that anesthesiologists are trained to correct during a surgery. And we have an assortment of strategies, including medications, that can help us make changes to electrolytes to keep them in safe ranges during surgery. There are situations where an anesthesiologist might have a suspicion that there's a higher than normal likelihood of a patient having a cardiac arrest during a surgery. A common example would be a type of cardiac surgery, and especially one where the heart is intentionally arrested, then there will definitely be a cardiac arrest. That would be like a coronary artery bypass graft that occurs on cardiopulmonary bypass. In surgeries like this, the heart is intentionally arrested. That's done so that the surgeon can operate on a heart that is motionless, because operating on a beating heart is more challenging, although that also can be done. Once the main portion of that type of surgery has been completed, then of course we want to restart the heart, and often that involves delivering electrotherapy, meaning shocking the heart. In other types of surgeries where it's not planned to intentionally arrest the patient's heart, we may have a patient who has known cardiac rhythm abnormalities that put them at a higher risk of having an arrest. So in these types of cases, whether a cardiac arrest is either planned or there's a higher likelihood of that happening, we can prepare by putting electrodes on the patient so that we can very easily deliver an electric shock. The two electrodes basically just need to be placed such that the heart is somewhere in between the two of them. So when electricity passes from one electrode to the other, it also passes through the heart. The electrodes we use at my hospital are basically just sticky pads that have a wire that we can connect to a defibrillator just like this one. The electrodes that are placed on the patient can be connected to the defibrillator and left there for the entire surgery so that if an electrotherapy is needed, it can be delivered in a heartbeat. Sorry. Regardless of a patient's risk, it's actually standard of care for us to have EKGs attached to a patient throughout the duration of the anesthesia being delivered. The purpose of the EKG is to be able to monitor a patient's cardiac rhythm throughout the entirety of the procedure and make sure there aren't any abnormalities that arise and need treatment. While it can sometimes seem to an outsider like anesthesiologists are just sitting in a chair not doing anything at all for the duration of surgery, there's a lot of active vigilance that goes into monitoring a patient's vital signs and what's occurring during surgery. If an intraoperative cardiac arrest does occur, then treatment generally entails standard advanced cardiovascular life support, or ACLS, protocol. This is something that all anesthesiologists are very familiar with and is a cornerstone for being able to resuscitate patients. There are several causes of cardiac arrest that necessitate electrotherapy, but it's also worth pointing out that there are several causes of cardiac arrest that don't entail electrotherapy as part of treatment. However, the medication epinephrine, which is a vasopressor, is indicated for any cause of cardiac arrest. There are other medications like lidocaine and amiodarone that are part of the ACLS algorithm, and if you'd like to see that algorithm, you can click the link below that I left in the description. Depending on the circumstances of the surgery and what has led to cardiac arrest, we may ask the surgeon to stop operating and start performing chest compressions. After all, chest compressions are part of doing ACLS. However, we do have to take the circumstances into account because if the cause of cardiac arrest is hypovolemia from hemorrhage, meaning to say the patient has started to bleed a significant amount and that led their heart to stop, then we want the surgeon to focus on stopping the bleeding 
instead of doing chest compression. Again, this video is not medical advice, and if you would like a nice review of intraoperative cardiac arrest, then there's an excellent article that I've linked in the description for this video where you can read all about the considerations that anesthesiologists have for thinking about intraoperative cardiac arrest. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video that I made where I documented what it was like being on call as I rotated through cardiothoracic anesthesia. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.